So sitting in St Gabriel's Church Hall in Pimlico, in the early stages of Mid Wales's Albert Herring production rehearsals, which is the 2013 offering we have, I'm sitting with Albert Christopher Turner, and going to be talking to you, grilling you a little bit about what about you think about this this wonderful role in a moment. But we're doing uh, Albert Herring this year uh, because it's Britain's centenary. We've chosen that work because it's, frankly, his funniest, most approachable work. It's exactly the right size. He could, in fact, have written it for Midwell's Opera. And indeed, after the first performance, which was in 1947 in Glyndebourne, uh, they went away, he and Peter Pears, and indeed many other of their close friends, including Joan Cross, who played Lady Billows and so forth, they went off and formed the English Opera Group, which is exactly similar to what Midwell's does now. So the, the glove fits absolutely perfectly. And I hope that people come Coming for the first time to Albert, or even more so, those feeling Britain, uh, one, one composer too far from me, I'm a bit modern, will actually come and see that it's the most glorious music. It goes back over the centuries. It does. You've got Handel, you've got Gilbert and Sullivan, you've got Victorian hymns, you've got everything in there when he's painting this wonderful picture of uh, British society, English society, uh, in the early part of the century. Although, in fact, our director is updating it to the 70s, actually very cleverly and very... Um, appositely updating it. So it's actually a glorious patchwork which will make you laugh most of the time. It'll make you cry just with the insight into human nature and to the way Albert is treated, which is not nice. But Albert, I think, comes out of it, if not smelling of roses, because you have had a few drinks, <laughs> but you come out of it as the one, I think, who beats the, beats the lot. And I think also you'll come out with that mirror up to yourself, which is what the theatre should do. It should put a mirror up to us all and make us think a little bit. And if that... I don't want to play that too heavily, but I think that is something that the piece does. So, and I'm now going to turn to Chris, and uh, we're going to have a little chat about what you feel about the role. Chris, this is your first Albert Herring, I think. It is, yeah. What are the challenges? Oh, there's plenty of challenges, actually, Nick. It's a, a very difficult vocal line to actually manage. There's an awful lot to the character. It's uh, the difficulties of playing an insular character, but also having these very outbursting and abundant vocal lines. And what does that tell you about Albert as a person, either way you've described Britain setting it? Well, I think Albert is a, a very interesting character. He's uh, kept in this very close-knit of characters that we've got in Loxford, this beautiful village uh, that the play is set in. Um, and I think the interesting thing about him is that having these characters around him makes him so quiet and so shy. He's very aware of what's going around him, but when he does let go, he really lets go. And I think Britain and the music, really from quite an early stage of the Albert music, mm. tells you that, doesn't he? I mean, you've Absolutely. got the, you know, the, the, the sort of small answers and then are all the vegetables and mm -hmm. mum, but actually pretty early on, you get your own music. It can only be yours. It's not the sort of somewhat more pastiche music that Britain does so brilliantly for these other characters who have a veneer, which is one of the whole points of the piece. In a way, you are the most honest one there. And you're, I think, mm -hmm. not quite as weak and foolish as they think you are and as possibly Albert is painted. Is that how you're going to play? I think, I think so. I think you're absolutely right. I think Albert is often played as a bit of a simpleton. Um, but I don't think he actually is. I think you're absolutely right about Britain. He's so specific that whenever Albert is on the scene mm. or introduced into a scene, you hear his music. Yes. And there's, a, there's an honesty in the music. There's a simplicity about the music that mm. makes the character uh, seems honest. I think he's possibly one of the only honest characters in the whole opera. There's no facade with Albert. Mm. He's just very quiet and always very reserved. I think he's very aware of what's going on around him. I think he's very aware of what each character is playing as such. And his inner world is seen, as I said, quite early on and in very much at the end of Act Two, which is your really mm -hmm. big moment when you come back from your night out and, mm -hmm. and, and, and whatever. Um, where do you see it? It comes two years after Peter Grimes. Do you see them as similar characters? If there are, what, what are some of the similarities? Oh, I, I, I think so. I mean, I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of similarities between Albert and Peter Grimes. Peter Grimes is also a, a, an opera which one day I hope to sing. It's a wonderful role. But... Peter Grimes himself is, again, another very insular character. Um, Ellen Orford could be likened to Albert Herring's mother. Oh. She's often the person in Peter Grimes that tries to defend him, tries to stick up for him, that also tries to control him, tries to put him on the straight and narrow. Uh, so on the surface, a, yeah. Grimes is, is, is stronger, isn't he? Yes, Special absolutely. That. But when we see into him, actually, yeah, yeah. so Grimes is sort of not as strong as we think he is. Albert is a lot stronger, perhaps, yes. than we think he is. Yeah. 
Um, you can't talk about doing a Britain work, a great Britain work like this, without mentioning Peter Pierce. For oh. whom it was written and Britain's, Britain's partner. Um, for a singer of your generation, mm -hmm. is, is Piers a, 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 is he over the top of you? I mean, did, or do you learn from him, or you just put out, out your mind what he did? How do you use him? You know, interestingly enough, I listened to four different recordings, um, and I've still got those four different recordings at home. Uh, Piers. Uh, was a wonderful singer. He had an, an, an exquisite way of using words, and I don't know whether that was because of the affiliation with, with Britain and how closely they probably wrote together, but the most wonderful thing about Piers, above most singers today, is that I think he stayed honest to the singing, and that was to sing with consistent line. Mm. Uh, yeah. It was beautiful. I, yeah, yeah. And he also, I mean, technically, uh, in the tenor voice, the, his favourite note was E, wasn't it? Britain found out this note E, which yeah. of course starts quite a lot of Albert's things. Yeah. It starts the great, when the great bear and Pleiades in Grimes. Yeah, and this was, just, just explain in terms of the layman like me can understand, mm -hmm. vocal layman, yep. what that meant, that, that he kind of had an ease up through what's technically known as the passaggio. He had Absolutely. an ease up to the top, which meant could, and that was part of, behind part of my question, is that that is, for those without that, Mm -hmm. type of voice. Yeah. Is that harder for you? I think it definitely is. I mean, uh, you know, you were absolutely right, uh, Peter Pears, all, all of, all the, all, all of uh, his, uh, the roles he's done tend to sit on E, as you've said, um, and it's just at the start of a tennis passaggio, actually. It's a difficult note. It can be sang in one of three or four different ways, and it's your choice how you sing, how you sing them, because every voice is different, but the the beautiful thing about Pierce is that it was an always an educated choice, but you never ever felt as the listener that it was educated. It always felt very natural. Yes. We're at the very beginning of the production, but mm -hmm. we've started to talk with Michael, our director, yeah, yeah. and we've started to work together, which mm -hmm. we've not done before. And I think we're yeah. onto something. What, what at this stage of the production do you think are the things that scream at you about Albert? And there's a crystal ball. What do you think? might develop down the two or two foot, well, we've got two and a half weeks in London, then the, then the time in Wales. What, so where are we now? Where are you now with Albert? And where do you think, where are your hunches that you will go with Albert as the character? You know, the interesting thing is, uh, Michael's been wonderful about allowing uh, each character to have um, a love for the roles that they believe that their characters are going to be. Um, I definitely think that in this Albert Herring, you'll see less of a simpleton. Yeah. I think you'll see more of an observer and I think, hopefully, if the crystal ball's right, when Albert does let loose, I think he'll really let loose. And I think Michael is very looking forward to seeing how that develops. I'm very looking forward to seeing how it develops. So we have the night on the town, but we also have that's a sort of almost a metaphor for him actually letting himself go and Absolutely. enjoying the, the things that life has to offer, which he's not been... He's never uh, been allowed. allowed. He's not Absolutely. been allowed by, by this, the love of his mother, who, who I think we feel actually loves him deeply and does what she does out of that and she's we i suspect are not going to find her painted as quite such a um Harrington as perhaps is sometimes done. that's a hunch we haven't got to that part of the we haven't yet, quite got there yet but i feel think that? i think you're absolutely right i think that there is genuine genuine uh, love uh, and i think uh, annie will do a wonderful job of, of playing mom there's more to be found in those two characters mom's music's quite of, often the same theme over and over and over, and it, it's, it's that quite... little yapa papa, which is kind of she's almost a, apart from when she's in ensemble and singing the ensemble music, mm -hmm. she's pretty much monothematic, and that's yeah. one of Britain's great geniuses that he can take the s smallest number of notes yeah. and really spin them because it's not. It's, although he sometimes disowned him, he's always said he's actually greatest influence of Beethoven, who was able to do that with a yeah. huge amount with the smallest smallest number of notes. But you can definitely hear that. I think I think that there's 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 genuine love from Mum for Albert. I think she's also a lady that's a little bit desperate. She's been left in a situation. She's with, a widow. Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, Albert's father's died, and he's the only man in her life. And I think with them having a greengrocer's, obviously she's had to take a step up and do more. Maybe oh, she needs him. Yeah, he's absolutely. Got to, got to be in the shop and sell, absolutely. Sell the There's there. only one person who can lift that hundred weight of turnips. Yeah, yeah. You know. And um, let's talk briefly about uh, the Tristan motive. That the love potion music from Wagner's Tristan comes in. Uh, actually, much uh, rather cleverly, it's hinted at even when Lady Billows is singing. Yes. Who is a get? You know, it's that's that's mm -hmm. another bit of wonderful musical dramatic mm -hmm. irony from Britain. But it comes very clearly when your lemonade is spiked yes. and you get drunk. But. What do you feel of this? I think in many respects it's your relationship to what Sid and Nancy, the lovers, the genuine, honest lovers, in mm -hmm. love, young love, beautiful love music a la mm -hmm. Falstaff, you know, Netta and Fenton yeah, in yeah. Verdi's Falstaff. Yeah. Uh, it's based on that. Um, Britain knew Falstaff, gave a copy of Falstaff to, the, to yes. Eric Crozier, the librettist. Yeah. So we've got to think Nanetta Fenton, yes. uh, where we go to that. 
What's Albert's relation to them? And what does it set off on this night of what's known as the night of debauchery, but it's actually much more serious than that? Yes, I think so. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I think uh, his relationship with, Al, uh, with, with Nancy and Sid uh, is two very different relationships. Um, I, I think with Sid, he's much more... I think he sees Sid as being that slightly older brother that's done a few things that Albert hasn't. But I think, like we were saying earlier on, I think Albert really does realise what Sid is. Sid's the kind of older brother that would push their younger brother that couldn't swim into the pool and hope that he'd survive. But he'd help him if needs be. Mm. I think he definitely, Sid definitely looks on as Albert as being a little bit, he knows he's an outsider and he tries to include him, but not necessarily always in the right way. Sometimes it makes Albert even more of an outsider. Nancy, on the other hand, I think Nancy embodies everything that... Albert Herring adores in yeah. a woman. She's very articulate. Um, even when she enters at the, the very, very top mm. of the opera with Albert and, uh, and Sid, she's, she's the articulate one. She's the very precise one. She's his biggest supporter. Absolutely. As we get to the beginning of that yeah. three, the regret aria, when yes. she says we, sh we shouldn't have done it. That's absolutely yeah. genuine. Yeah. yeah. But she can and be their love, he just, he just wants that. Am I, I think right? so. I think so, yes. I think he, he wants, he wants exactly what they know, have, yeah. Yeah. but doesn't necessarily want to be like Sid. He wants to be far more courteous and uh, he wants to, he, I, I think, you know, if, if, if Albert had his way and he was with Nancy, she would be on a pedal stool. Yeah. You know, she'd be very, very, very cared for, very looked after. And possibly, as our Sid, as, as Matthew said, you know, maybe, maybe he's a little stronger than Sid eventually and actually can break away from what he calls the so. apron strings, which Sid has done earlier. Well, we yeah. had a very interesting conversation about whether Sid was older than Albert, and that's still in the, still in the mist there. But I, I have a feeling that Albert might be... a. They're very similar ages, I think. Where, where do you see Albert Herring you know, in the panoply of, of the other Britain roles? Not so much from what you haven't haven't sung, because you're a yeah, singer and you yeah, will yeah. do many more, I'm sure, yeah. in the future. But where do you see him? Is there, is there a theme for you that goes through Britain's tenor roles? And where does Albert fit in that? You know, I, I think there really is. I, I, th I think uh, Britain, whenever he wrote for the tenor, wrote so beautifully for The Voice. It's... But what was he saying with that beauty? Well, I mean, I, I think it was not just... Well, I, you know, I think we have to really look at his relationship with Peter Pierce. I think an awful lot of has that has an awful lot of it has to do with that. And I think we would be silly not to consider the fact that maybe Peter Pierce has a had an awful lot to do with how the roles were written. I'm almost positive that you know there are times where Britain asks things of the voice that some composers would never have ever written as well. And it's almost like he's 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 that, that Britain's gone. How would I do this if I was a tenor? And I'm sure that. Mm. that Peter would have probably yeah. given him a hand. But interestingly, I agree with that, but interestingly, I don't think it changes so much, because, for example, take Les Illuminations, was yeah. not written for Pierce. And no. if you didn't know that, you'd think no. it probably was. So it was, it was not a big sea change. I don't think it was a big sea change. Yeah. I think it was an emotional uh, mm. relationship change, yeah. clearly, and yeah. it was a professional change that he, he could try out absolutely everything around the piano yeah. and whatever. But I don't see the, see the sea change. I, I just wonder whether, if one had, I don't like these naive questions, but if there was one, is it, and I'm asking you mm -hmm. as Chris playing Albert, yeah. is it the one of the outsider, the one seeking something beautiful, but something beautiful sometimes means you have to break the rules because doing something beautiful like the, what the things he sexually and otherwise wishes to do mm. are sometimes taboo, which they are in, in Loxford. They're yes, so absolutely. Up, up there, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But it, it isn't it outsider about what, what, what is beautiful and what life has in its richness, mm -hmm. it's also outsider against society. It's kind of outsider with yeah. two prongs. Is that sort of, I mean, I, no, I don't I want think, to put I, Britain's I, no, roles in a, in a box, but maybe... But I think you're absolutely right. I think yeah. in, in the majority of the, his roles for tenor, for tenor particularly, the tenor quite often plays a, um, a, an outsider that doesn't necessarily blend with the group and that quite often doesn't want to blend with the group. Right. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Not that he's just writing for an outsider. Even, even the male chorus quite often is mm. someone who stands outside and gives information on what they're seeing, but mm. never but very rarely gets involved. And I think, I think that's true of you know, something like the, the Peter Grimes and Albert Herring. Albert Herring is the outsider that will quite often sing about what he's seeing or how he's mm. feeling, but usually when he's on his own, yeah. you know? And, and I think it's the same for Peter Grimes. I mean, you know... And, and Ashen, Aschenbach's uh, wanting oh, yes. beauty in, in, yeah. in Death in Venice yeah. with the sexuality he ought not to have. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I think we're going to have a great time. So I've already yeah. enjoyed working with you on, on the ideas and with Michael and the rest, rest mm. of the team. It's going to be very and, exciting. Um, we'll have done how many by the end of the run? 20, 20, 22? 20, 20, 20, 22, is it? 23, something like that. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's a great chance. I think that's, I think that's what the Midwells Company has done for so many mm. years. And yeah. it's great, I think, to be 
able to do so many performances, and I think for, uh, it's a mainly young cast, I think mm. of people, and all yeah. the, the thing of touring, it sounds silly, we can, we've talked about the high art things, that what yeah. it is vocally yeah. and what it yeah. is, but there's also all those things about, you know, how do I get to the theatre, where's my dressing room, I've my, my, mm -hmm. my B&B, the, the, the bed's not made up or something, <laughs> they're, they're, I've got stuck on the motorway, all those True. things, I mean, that's, I think, what, what the Midwells company is about, part of what it's about yeah. is that, you know, chance to really get d down there in what the profession's about. Would you yeah, agree? absolutely, yeah. I do, I, I think it's, it, it enables you as a performer to kind of come across every obstacle, I think, mm. you know, you're working in a different theatre, every time you perform. Yeah. Quite often you won't do more than one or two performances in a row at that theatre. You're bringing music to a theatre that may ne might not necessarily have seen opera for a while. You're yeah. bringing music to a community that may, you know, that at one time may have been covered by some of the bigger companies that's no longer covered by the bigger companies. And I think that's the wonderful thing. You're opening up opera to, yeah. a, to an audience that might not, might not always have the chance. And final question. Uh, Britain has still, there's still some prejudice against Britain. They think, mm -hmm. either, some people even think he's modern. I'm not sure where they get yeah, that yeah. from. But, but there is still some prejudice. People are innately rather conservative. I think we probably mm -hmm. are in yeah. other parts of our lives. And yeah, I think yeah. people are in general yeah. are a little worried. What would you say to people who say, oh, I, I've heard it's a funny story. I've heard Britain's a great opera composer. I've heard it's a really wonderful depiction of this, this, this mm -hmm. rather narcissistic mm -hmm. sort of tight little town of Oxford. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them to persuade them to come? I think there, there's, there's many things I could say, but I think the one wonderful thing that you could say about Albert Herring is that you are going to have fun. You're going to hear some of the most sublime music yeah. and you're going to hear some of the most sublime ensembles. And you're going to have a laugh as well. Absolutely, absolutely. You, 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 you're, you, you're being presented with a, a group of characters that you will all identify with on some level. And I think that's what yeah. makes it funny. And I think you're also going to see some really deep, particularly in the characterization of Albert, mm. I think we really get inside him. I think you're going to see a mirror put up to yourself as well, because yes. that's actually what Crozier and Britain are doing. Mm. They're putting a mirror to everybody. Yeah. And of course, in Albert Herring, most of them, not all of them, mm -hmm. fall short. The Albert's the one that doesn't fall short, really, actually, mm -hmm. at all. No. So, Chris, it's been great talking to you. I'm hugely looking forward to working on this role with Me you. Me too. And doing all these performances, and already the insight, I think, is going to mm -hmm. help us a lot with our rehearsals. Be fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.